This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Uh, our next speaker doesn't come to us from a critical care background. Uh, Dr. Schoenberg Orgard is um, a senior lecturer in the Department of Management Communications and Director of Education Innovations at the University of Waikato that's in Hamilton here in New Zealand. She has taught, published and presented on a fascinating range of topics. Uh, organisational change, uh, identity, leadership, conflict resolution uh, and the balance of power. I like that one. Um, she's also, she has, she's not completely naive to the medical environment. She's worked closely with Organ Donation New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Schoenberg Orgard has an interest in gender issues um, and she's going to use her expertise in communication to talk to us now about gender communication styles and what they bring um, to their workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Engamana. Enga reo, e ro rangatira ma, tēnā koto katoa. Enga mate haere haere atura. Enga iwi i hui hui nei, tēnā koto. E nā manuhiri no mai haere mai ki tēne hui. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Ko Michelle Schoenberg roga toko ingoa, no te whariwānanga o wakatoa ho. Um, to all authorities, all languages, and all chiefly people represented here, greetings to you all. To those who have passed on, farewell. To all people gathered here today, greetings. To the visitors, welcome to this gathering, and greetings to you all. My name is Michelle schoenberger Ogad, and I come from the University of Waikato. Kia ora. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to be here addressing you and to see so many of you interested in gender and communication in the audience. Um, I've developed quite an interest in the field of gender and communication, and in particular when I was teaching an honours class in public relations, which is a field and a profession which is dominated by women but led by men. Uh, they seem to hold all the leadership roles, even though 90% of the workers in that profession are in fact women. As the, the discussion developed in a class of 21-year-olds, uh, it became very apparent very quickly that the young women in the class had never really considered the issue of gender as even pertaining to themselves. Um, and they hadn't thought that there were any issues that they needed to face. Their mothers had done all the work for them back in the 70s. I know that some of you will remember those days. <laughs> Um, and the more we discussed it in class, they began to reflect on their own experiences and they became aware of the little things, the things that they had up until that point shrugged off as simply, oh, it's the way we do things, out of the way things that happen around here. So in the academic literature in uh, communication, there's a considerable debate as to whether there are gender differences in communication. And if there are, are those differences large enough that they make any difference? Deborah Tannen is a um, communication researcher who has done a lot of work on the context of gender communication. And she's looked in part at that huge breadth of research in the field by looking at the way that the, uh, people communicate and differences in syntax, semantics, non-verbal communication and the expressions and other communicative acts that we all have. Um, and of course that well-known book by John Gray, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, brought gender issues into the, um, into the popular culture. Uh, it became an affirmation of many differences and people accepted it was just the way things were. And they were real and they were okay. Um, language determines how we categorise things and people and the use of language, though it changes over time, still underpins the way we construct our social life, our work life and everything that we do. Um, the social construction of reality looks at the ways we jointly develop our understandings of the world through language 
and language, even though it changes over time and takes on different meanings, it still constructs our realities. Um, just to give you a little example of how words are used and how, uh, picking up on some of the things that Lucy was saying about biases and schemas that we have developed in, um, in it's so deeply embedded in the way that we do things. The word manager, you know, you have a vision of what is a manager. It's always, almost always male, isn't it? Because the word man is in there, right? But when we look at manager and look at the root of that word, the man part comes from the Latin manus, which is hand. So the hand that directs things, the direction aspect, rather than the male aspect of it. And even if the male aspect was even a part of the uh, format of that word. Uh, we see men when we think about managers, and uh, that was then translated, you might remember some of you, going back a little bit, when we talked about chair, the chairman of a panel. And there was a, a huge move in the language when we discussed, um, well, it's a woman who's going to be chairing this section, so we better call them chairwomen or chairpersons. And we will neutralize it completely. But chairman, again, with the word hand in there, managed the meeting. That was what they did. So women could be chairmen, and neutral people could be chairmen as well. Um, so it's about taking hold of these kinds of things and understanding where they come. But that use of language always produces the images. I mean, I do this all the time. She is, I go to a woman doctor. I never say that I go to a man doctor. Ever. Ever. Um, and surprisingly, it's a woman CEO that heads that company, or a woman director who sits on the board. We never talk about man CEOs, and we don't talk about man directors. But then I got to what I talk about a woman builder, or a plumber, or a tradeswoman. Is it only in the professions that we actually need woman as an adjective? I'm not sure, I've just put that idea out there. Um, but to me it sort of suggests that we have gendered expectations the same way as a nurse in the field will nearly always be a woman. Um, another. Uh, this idea of cognitive bias that Lucy talked about earlier, Tversky and Kahneman back in the 1970s, they talked about these biases as being a systematic error of judgment that was based somewhere that it was difficult to identify where. But they're so embedded in the way that we do things and the way that we've constructed our worlds, they have now become a completely subconscious situation for us. So when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, women mainly aspired to work before settling down. And the work that we did was, was secretary, teacher, and nurse. And these are all gendered um, names. Of course, men were expected to take responsibility for the support of the family. But those things were so embedded in the way that I was growing up that even as I was studying in the 60s and early 70s, and that the days of women's liberation, the writings of Germaine Greer, Kate Millett, and Gloria Steinem, I was still completely unaware of my own inbuilt biases and also accepted that this was the way the world worked. And I, of all people, especially I had had a mother who had uh, uh, started up a business on her own in a tiny town in New Zealand in 1936. And she had told me the stories of her life of how she couldn't get a bank account because she didn't have a husband to sign for her, because her father was too far away to take responsibility for it. And the fact that she was determined to carry on and go forward. I had never really thought about it in terms of my own life. That was until I went to Africa, but that's another story. But those biases still come out today, even that I say that I'm absolutely totally aware of, aware of it. When the image I have of a new appointment today in the university, talking about it with my manager and saying, well, when he starts, it will be um, probably beginning of the year. And he turned to me and he said, why are you saying he? 
I absolutely imagine that it will be a she. So it's not on, on just on the one side that uh, myself as a woman will have those biases. Those biases except, um, exist on both sides. Uh, again, um, Lucy's preempted me somewhat in her, in her talk, and um, I was talking, uh, thinking about the issue of merit again, the merit argument based on uh, that I want to be judged for the merit that I bring to my profession. But we're also basing it on the assumption that the people who are judging my merit do not have a cognitive bias in any way whatsoever, that they will be judging that it, there is such a thing as objectivity. I don't know in the medical profession, but I certainly know that in many of the other professions there's no such thing as objectivity. We cannot do that. And uh, biases are so unconscious and so embedded, to, ed, embedded, even if we bring them to the surface, a lot of people will deny that they actually exist. And to me, when somebody said, oh, I think it should really be based on merit, I think it's a get out of jail argument. It's simply a justification for making a decision that you make, rather than to really consider what the situation is and the argument that both Sarah and Lucy have put to you today of maybe there are different ways of talking about it and uh, discussing it. Uh, lots of assumptions are made about women, particularly if they're of childbearing age, and there's that assumption that it's okay to ask questions about their private lives. You know, are you planning on having a baby? Oh, you don't have a partner. But when you do, you'll have a baby, won't you? You know, those kinds of things that are assuming what your role is going to be and how you're going to be living your life. So, are there gender communication styles? Yes, of course there are. There's no question. I can't deny it. Because men and women approach issues differently and appropriately to their gender. There's not one way of communica communicating. We all communicate quite differently. So the styles of communication in the workplace are contextualised by the environment in which you are working, as well as by the gender differences. The con context is important, but it's also often in the hierarchical professions, like medicine, that it's not necessarily gender, but rather power that drives communication and it can often be interpreted on the basis of gender. And yeah, I'm sure you can all think of the different power differentials in the work that you do. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg, who um, influenced me a lot when I first saw her speech on TED Talks, um, and she started up, she is the Chief Operating Officer of Facebook, and she started up a group called Lean In, encouraging young women and women of all ages to think about how gender is controlling and doing things in the workplace. And she suggested that this is not a thing that we should throw away and say that we should deny that there are differences and women are as good as men and that we should be aspiring to the same things that men aspire to, but really to change the discourse, to lean into the discourse. And so I guess my key message to you today is to actually lean in and to be confident that you can make significant contributions to the conversation in the workplace, that you take that power back and you can change what is being said and that when you are upset or offended by something somebody says to you, be they male or female, Take your courage in both hands and lean in. Call them on it. Tell them, because you can be sure that probably their intentions were never to upset you or to offend you. They have the same cognitive biases that all of us do, and they've never thought about it until you mentioned it to them. So just lean in, it'll be fine. Norera tenakoto, tenakoto katoa.